Habitat Restoration Coordinator at CRCL and today I'm going to talk to you guys about our restoration efforts in the Maurepaul wetlands. So I'll begin with a little bit of background about us. We are Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana or CRCL for short and CRCL is Louisiana's oldest statewide nonprofit organization that's dedicated to coastal restoration. It was established in 1988 by a small group who recognized the importance of the land loss issue at the time but we've grown over the years to be an educated advocate for coastal restoration efforts, such as the State Coastal Master Plan, which is just the guiding document that CPRA developed to protect and restore the Louisiana coast. Um, but it's built on a solid foundation of scientific and engineering principles. CRCL also has expertise in policy, science, outreach, and on-the-ground restoration. So we attempt to connect with thousands of people each year through newsletters, conferences, and volunteer and outreach events. So why are we doing all of this? Well, there are many reasons why Louisiana's coast is important. If we allow this ecosystem to disappear, we risk losing our communities, our culture, our economic security, and our future. Louisiana is losing land every day. Over 2,000 square miles has been lost since the 1930s. We urgently need large-scale land building, such as sediment diversions, to use the power of the river to build land. So in case you're unfamiliar with what a sediment diversion is, um, it's just a controlled cut in the river that allows fresh water and sediment to flow into the wetlands. So it's important to note that the state and federal governments control the most critical actions needed to advance these projects. So all the work that we do serves the purpose of driving this needed action. Most of this land that's been lost has been the wetlands that provide storm protection for us. So wetlands and barrier islands form a natural buffer zone that absorbs storm surge and reduces the force of high winds. Scientists estimate that approximately 2.7 miles of wetlands is capable of absorbing one foot of storm surge. So in this presentation, we will highlight one of our recent projects, the Moorpaw Land Bridge, and I will explain how and why we chose to focus on this area, how we are assessing success, what challenges we face along the way, and what we're doing to ensure we meet our goals over the long term. So CRCL has held tree plantings along the Maurepaul Land Bridge since 2016, which is just the swamps in between Lake Maurepaul on the west and Lake Pontchartrain on the east. Land bridges are a critical risk reduction feature in the landscape, and as I said, healthy swamp forests in general are an important storm buffer. They're effective for reducing storm surge for communities around Lake Maurepaul, including East Baton Rouge. So it's very important to maintain the land bridge as well as to expand this important habitat type in the region. So between 2016 and 2020, CRCL has had 15 planting events out on the land bridge. We've planted 8,900 trees in this time period and most of these trees are approximately one-year-old saplings grown by ERS or Ecological Restoration Services. We plant mostly bald cypress, but also water tupelo and red swamp maple, which are also native to the area. We've restored roughly 59 acres and engaged 555 volunteers during this time period as well. And our partner organization, LPBF, has actually had plantings out here for years before we even started as well. I believe their plantings began in 2014. So our organization is just one of many in a larger campaign called the MRD, or Restore the Mississippi River Delta. And our mission is basically in the title. We focus on reconnecting the Mississippi River to its delta to protect people, wildlife, and jobs. We're a coalition of environmental organizations, two local and three national, and we're all working together to advance coastal restoration solutions. So of these five organizations, um, it includes us, CRCL, um, Environmental Defense Fund, EDF, Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation, or LPBF, National Wildlife Federation, NWF, and Audubon. 
So we all work together to advance coastal restoration solutions, as I said, by engaging stakeholders such as coastal residents, business owners, industry representatives, local and state government officials, and other groups and organizations to educate and engage them on our changing coasts and to build support for addressing the issue with urgency. Um, we also try to understand and make the best science available because it's very important to make sure we are using the latest scientific research and modeling to understand what our coast will look like in the future with action and then without action. So we have to be able to make recommendations and comments on projects that are being planned around the coast. And we also work to maximize coastal funding. So we actively try to leverage the current available funding for coastal restoration and seek additional funding for existing and future projects that will provide protection. So CRCL is unique in the sense that we have a habitat restoration program that began in 2000 and it engages stakeholders and volunteers by facilitating hands-on restoration work. We hold large volunteer grass plantings and tree plantings to restore and enhance Louisiana's wetland environments that have been impacted by coastal land loss. These events promote community involvement and increase awareness of the impact of coastal land loss. And many times we partner with the other local organization in the MRD for our plantings, um, which is called the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation, or LPBF, as I've said, and they actually hold their own volunteer plantings as well. So I'll go back to focusing now on the Maurepas Wetlands region. Um, LPBF has identified over 75,000 acres of land suitable for swamp restoration in the Pontchartrain Basin. And this is primarily around the Carnarvon Freshwater Diversion and the Maurepas Land Bridge. So success of swamp restoration plantings depends largely on identifying suitable planting locations where the soil salinity and the hydrological conditions yield good survivorship and growth rates for the vegetation being planted. LPBF has been monitoring soil salinity throughout the basin for the past seven years, and they have integrated their data plus some other data into these hydrocoast maps. And here you'll see an example of um, one of them on the right side of the screen. So in general, the maximum soil salinity tolerated by swamp tree species in southern Louisiana is 2.5 parts per thousand. So in other words, if the soil is too salty for the trees to survive, we won't plant there. And we generally don't hold large scale plantings in areas greater than 2.5 PPT. So LPBF's Hydrocoast program collects multiple environmentally dynamic data sets to monitor the condition of the basin's estuaries. So the health of estuaries depend on many external influences, such as wind, rainfall, tide, and even freshwater influx from streams and river diversions. So all of these factors can cause salinity fluctuation within the basin, and they all play a role in the estuary's health. The program monitors all of this over a seven day period and they produce these bi-weekly hydrocoast maps to display the hydrology for the Pontchartrain Basin, showing the movement of water and salinity across the basin. Um, and they actually produce a series of maps for both the Pontchartrain and Banatari Basin. They use field data, LDWF water quality data, satellite imagery, precipitation and wind data, as well as permanent monitoring stations in the basin, such as USGS buoys, CRIM stations, and so on. So these maps on the screen are taken from a November 2019 Hydrocoast period. Um, and you'll see five maps here. One of them is the salinity map. And then there's also a weather map, which shows rainfall across the basin, as well as wind speed and direction. The water quality map is showing the basin's impaired water bodies for primary contact, such as swimming and secondary contact, such as boating and wading. And then there's a biological map, which shows the impaired bodies of water for fishing and oyster propagation in the basin. Um, and then finally, a habitat map, which shows soil water salinity contours across the land masses and benthic zones. 
which is um, the species that occupy the water bottoms across the estuary. And they use a lot of this data from the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, or DEQ, as um, they prepare these maps. And so these maps are actually a great tool to use for scientific discussion, restoration planning between state and federal agencies, and they can be used by the commercial and recreational fishing industry and community. So this is an example of a Pontchartrain Basin Hydrocoast map from mid-November of 2019. It explains which bodies of water kept constant salinities and which ones increased or decreased, as well as the change in discharges. It lists average daily discharge differences between the last hydrocoast and current hydrocoast period. And these hydrocoast maps and all of this data is available to the public. You can sign up to receive um, emails on LPBF's website at saveourlake.org if you're interested. So now that we've talked about how the area is monitored, I'm going to go into some background about the region. So the Morpaw region specifically has been influenced by shipping channels and canals, for example, the construction of the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, or Mr. Go for short, which opened in 1965 um, because they were hoping to provide a shorter route for transportation from the Gulf of Mexico to the Port of New Orleans. But it ended up being a bad idea because it allowed salt water from the Gulf to travel up the canal into the Pontchartrain Basin, which killed large areas of freshwater species. Historically, the land bridge contained swamp forests dominated by bald cypress. But in the early 1900s, demand for bald cypress lumber increased and the land bridge was eventually clear cut until large scale logging ceased around 1965. And as I said, logging canals facilitated saltwater intrusion, but also impoundments. And these permanently flooded conditions prevented natural regeneration because seeds need a period of drawdown to germinate. And then of course, we have invasive species such as nutria rats, which were introduced in the 1930s for fur trade, but they have become a serious problem in Louisiana's coastal habitats, just in general. Um, these rodents are related to muskrats and beavers and they consume the roots of the saplings that we plant that hold the soil in place. And of course, this prevents new tree growth. Additionally, there was a severe drought in 1999 and 2000 that caused salinity in the area to spike, which also killed many trees. So natural regeneration was limited by all of these factors. So we know that the land loss crisis isn't just caused by one thing. It's a variety of factors, both man-made and natural causes, that have all contributed to the problem. So the whole Mississippi River Delta is being affected by the levees being built after the Great Flood of 1927, which disconnected the Mississippi River from the surrounding wetlands, and the lack of important freshwater sediment and nutrients being put back into the system. Um, also subsidence. So land formed by river sediment naturally compresses and sinks over time. And naturally this wouldn't be an issue because the river would continue to disperse sediment that rebuilds the land. But with the river being cut off from the levees, we have this constant sinking, but no growth. Um, and then, you know, because Louisiana experiences subsidence, we experience relative sea level rise which basically means that as we sink, the sea level is also rising, which is increasing with climate change too. So who owns the land? Most of the land bridge is managed by Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries or LDWF as wildlife management areas or WMAs. So there's three large WMAs that exist in the area and the remaining area is privately owned. So therefore we have to get permits from these landowners to actually plant here and restore this area. But thanks to these landowners supporting what we do, 
Um, we and LPBF have planted over 35,000 wetland trees on the land bridge. How do we ensure the success of our plantings here? Well, the closure of the Mr. Go in 2009 has allowed for the gradual reduction of salinity in the system, allowing freshwater species, such as the cypress, to return to the area. Our tree plantings here are helping to start the return of these coastal swamp forests. And then due to a recent push to reopen the Mr. Go, the Hydrocoast maps have helped us track the positive response to keeping it closed. So then once planted, every tree is fitted with a tree protector or more officially a nutrient excluder device or an NED to prevent the saplings roots from being eaten. And then of course we monitor the trees. So monitoring on the land bridge has provided info about the survival and growth of trees planted in hydrologically disconnected river basins. So CRCL takes baseline data on 10% of the trees planted such as diameter at breast height and tree height and then uses a GPS to take their locations. These trees are marked clearly with fluorescent paint and flags mostly because finding a particular tree a year later in the marsh is difficult through dense native vegetation. And then we return to each site annually to monitor these tagged trees and the overall survival rate. And the survival rate has actually been above 80%, which is really good. So as I previously said, CRCL plants mainly bald cypress, water tupelo, and red swamp maple on the land bridge. Um, LPBF has actually attempted to plant other species such as black gum tupelo, but due to low survival, black gum tupelo trees have not been planted after 2017. So now I'll talk about some challenges that we face with this region. Um, so as I said, the land bridge is hydrologically disconnected from the Mississippi River. So the area has become isolated and nutrient starved which may be impacting tree growth on the land bridge. Of course, we have nutria, so unprotected trees will most likely be uprooted and chewed down at the base. And then here I have a picture of this deer pea vine. Um, this is actually a picture from LPBF in the Carnarvon area. Deer pea is native in Southeast Louisiana and adapted to a salinity range of zero to 10, um, it's common in fresh to brackish marshes, but for the past few years, deer pea has been observed growing on newly planted trees, especially along the banks of the middle bayou of the land bridge. So the overall negative effects appear limited, but it likely inhibits growth by covering and then bending the trees. Anecdotal evidence suggests that deer pea smothers marsh vegetation, turning productive marsh into open mudflats, although published literature on this is limited. And then we have, of course, these major weather events and storm-related wind surge also affects tree growth by smothering plants. Lastly, we have marsh inundation. So marsh inundation is basically just extended or frequent flooding that can happen on the land bridge. And this can have a negative impact on tree survival and productivity. Marsh inundation is linked to climate, meaning precipitation, storms, and temperature. So it depends on wind speed and direction and proximity to water bodies as tides can force surface water onto the marsh surfaces, sometimes for extended periods of time. The duration of annual marsh inundation on the land bridge has increased over the past years, likely affecting tree growth. LPBF usually measures and analyzes marsh inundation relative to marsh surface elevation by using hydrological data from CRIM stations or coastwide reference monitoring system stations as well as site-specific marsh elevation data acquired by their staff using a Trimble receiver. So this figure on the screen is a CPRA chart that was created using the CRIMS data, and it's showing the percentage of flooding on different areas of the land bridge from October 2018 to September 2019. And frequent inundation on the marsh can make plantings potentially unsafe and hard to properly execute. 
So water levels need to be monitored, which is why we check the Manchac River gauge before we hold the planting, because there can't be more than one foot of water on the marsh. So does it actually matter who is planting these trees? Well, it does appear to make a difference on tree survival, depending on who is actually doing the planting. Based on some useful data that LPBF found, it shows that volunteer planted trees have a 61% overall survival rate. Commercially planted trees have a 86% overall survival rate, while plant professional staff planted trees, um, such as LPBF and MRD, um, we can plant trees that will have a 95% overall survival rate. But volunteer planted trees are the most common of all planted trees for restoration. There are three times more volunteer planted trees than commercially planted trees. So volunteers should be made aware that the quality of their work impacts tree survival, and they should be properly taught how to effectively plant. For example, trees should be planted 10 to 15 feet apart to ensure proper coverage of the planting area and to avoid competition between the trees. So there are other efforts that we can try to restore this area other than just planting trees. There's of course natural swamp regeneration, but also aerial seeding. And aerial seeding is just a technique of sowing seeds by spraying them through aerial means such as using a drone, plane, or helicopter. And as I said, LPBF has estimated that over 75,000 of acres within the basin are currently restoration ready. However, most of this acreage is restricted to areas that we can't access, meaning they can only be accessed by boat or vehicle, which resulted in only about 400 acres planted as of now. Some natural regeneration was observed on a large area of the land bridge in 2015, where some adult swamp tree species were observed seeding and some younger trees of different ages were growing. However, natural swamp regeneration may be slow and unpredictable, so aerial seeding could be used as an option. This picture I have on the screen is actually one from LPBF, doing an initial test to determine whether aerial seeding on a larger scale would be effective. So they scouted potential aerial seeding sites in the Moorpaw region and chose two sites. They ordered over 140 pounds of seeds ranging from bald cypress, green ash, red swamp maple, and black gun tupelo, and then they deployed them in May of 2018. They checked both sites a few months later and found some germination, but it was hard to identify which species germinated, and they couldn't really determine whether germination occurred from the aerial seeding or if it was from some older stands of bald cypress that existed in the area. So lesson learned, um, future, future aerial seeding requires pre and post monitoring which may be able to help clarify whether seedling growth occurred from naturally or aerially dropped seeds. However, as of LPBF's most recent monitoring of the aerial seeding in Moorpaw, they haven't found any germinated seeds or young cypress trees from these efforts. So what is the state doing to ensure the long-term survivability of the area? Well, there are these Mississippi River diversions with the potential to impact the land bridge that are in the planning stages. And our plantings will actually help support these larger restoration efforts in this area. So two examples are the Moorpaw Diversion, also known as the River Reintroduction into Moorpaw Swamp, and also the Manchac Land Bridge Diversion. So the Moorpaw Diversion is a freshwater diversion that's in the engineering and design phase and it will provide sediment and fresh water into existing wetlands in East Moorpaw Swamp. So this will benefit the swamp by reconnecting it with the river, aiding the prevention of further wetland loss and the conversion of swamps to marshes, as well as helping to offset future increases in salinity throughout the western Pontchartrain Basin. The fine-grained sediment may also increase elevation to a point where there are periods without inundation so that seeds can germinate, perpetuating the forest into the future. 
So the Manchac land bridge diversion is a sediment diversion, which is in the conceptual phase. But this will be constructed within the existing western guide levee of the Bonnicari Spillway. Currently, when the spillway is opened to reduce river flood risk in New Orleans, all of the sediment, freshwater, and nutrients are directed into Lake Pontchartrain, wasting these vital resources and causing water quality issues. So the Manchac diversion will direct some of these flows into degraded swamps and marshes adjacent to the spillway to increase nutrient input and improve water quality, fostering vegetation growth. So just as land loss is a result of many factors, building and sustaining land across our coasts cannot be achieved through any single project type. Restoring Louisiana's coast will require a group of projects from the state's coastal master plan, including sediment diversions to build detaic wetlands, which is probably the most important one, but also using barrier island restoration, marsh creation, hydrologic restoration, oyster reef restoration, shoreline protection, and ridge restoration. And this picture I have up in the corner is an example of a marsh creation project. So over the years of tree planting and monitoring in the Pontchartrain Basin, along with LPBF, we have obtained critical information to understand swamp restoration throughout the basin under changing environmental conditions. Our plantings in regions, such as the Moripal Swamp, are not only growing into helpful storm buffers, but the establishing dense tree root systems will stabilize the land and help reduce the impacts from subsidence. These planted species continue to survive at a healthy rate, and hopefully we will see growth rates continue to increase in years to come. So together, we will continue to do everything we can to save our coast. And that's all I have for you guys today. But if you're interested in volunteering with us or just learning more about our organization, visit sierracl.org.